The year 1900 began a new century, but brought with it an old desire. Aviation pioneers the world over continued to work diligently, hoping to discover the secrets of flight. First with models, kites, and gliders, success was hard-earned and progress seemed slow. Then 1903 brought the history-making events of Kitty Hawk. By 1907, everyone, from governments to industries, from the press to spellbound observers and grumbling skeptics, had to admit that the era of the flying machine had arrived. In that same year, on January 28, 1907, came another arrival in Lake Arthur, Louisiana, the birth of L. Ray B. Jeppesen. Well, that's the first thing I remember, watching the middle of the Eagles come swooping around, picking up some chickens once in a while. I said how they were flying on that thing. His old airplanes, you know, you could, when you started down the runway, you could kind of feel the air take a hold of the wings and take a hold of the controls. For the day, you don't feel any of that at all. And that just made you part of the bird itself. As the years would prove, this boy, who couldn't stop thinking about flying, was destined to make aviation history. I'm a product of the 1920 barnstorming days. In 1921, I took my first airplane ride with a barnstorming pilot and a Jenny. Really got a thrill out of it. Thought to myself, boy, this is for me. Several years later, I got my pilot's license. It was signed by Orville Wright. I was 19 years old and raring to go. Rounded up $500 and bought the airplane and started flying. I was better than being on the football team. <laughs> Couldn't have had more fun. I gave up high school. I was going to go to MIT, be an aeronautical engineer, but I didn't get, never did get out of the airplane long enough. For a while, Jeppesen, better known as Jepp, was employed by the Tex Rankin Flying Circus as a ticket seller, prop twister, aerobatic pilot, and wing walker. I was a very timid wing walker. Only reason I'd do it is when the fellow wouldn't show up. But I was no pro. I want to get back in the airplane. In 1930, the daring young Jeppesen signed on as an airmail pilot, flying for Boeing Air Transport. Jepp took on the treacherous, uncharted terrain between Salt Lake City and Cheyenne. His passion for flying seemed to overshadow the dangers of being a professional aviator. You couldn't go to the to the university library and find out how to run an airline. Yeah, we were, we were solving the problems daily. And I thought it was pretty exciting. Since there were no aeronautical charts, pilots in those days used road maps to help them navigate. And of course, pilots could always follow the Union Pacific Railroad track, which they called hugging the UP. Jeppesen managed to survive as an airmail pilot many of his fellow aviators did not. That winter we lost four of our 18 pilots, all good friends. Responsible for finding his own way, Jep made notes on everything and anything that would keep him flying the safest routes. And uh, Bill Boyne gave us a nice big airplane, the post office gives us a sack of mail, it's your business to get from A to B. And uh, that's where the little black book came in to keep giving me the information I needed to whether I'm going to go through this canyon or through this one and whether I could see the lights through the pass and all that sort of thing. Jep went to great extremes to collect information for his little black book. Strapping on as many as three altimeters, he climbed mountains and smokestacks to record elevations. From Chicago to Oakland, he spoke to police, engineers, and surveyors, anyone with facts and figures that could be added to his book. Meticulously drawn by hand, Jep included airport layouts with field lengths and elevations, locations of emergency landing areas, and potentially dangerous obstacles. He even listed the phone numbers of farmers to call for weather reports along his route. Got a lot of cooperation from farmers, you know, and sheriffs, and even cowboys and out in Wyoming and that part of it, was, it wasn't as difficult as I thought it was going to be. As fellow pilots showed interest in Jep's little black book of charts, Jep began making copies. He sold his pocket airway manual for $10 each, and before he knew it, 
Jeff was in business. In the late 1930s, Boeing Air Transport and several other companies merged to become United Airlines, and Jeff became a captain. Back then, United was printing its own charts, but when pilots insisted that they preferred Jeff's charts, United subscribed to the Jeppesen Airway Manual Service. Soon, many other airlines did the same. In my early years of flying, some 60 years ago, the most enthusiastic thing we did, that I thought, was introduce the public to an airplane. And that was doing it on an alfalfa field or on a sand pile somewhere. And then look at what we have here today. The change we've gone through, no one could even forecast it or dream of it hardly. I'd love to have some of the old pilots like Jack Knight see what we have here today. When you started, did you ever think your jet maps would literally be all over the world? No. I just made some of in Cheyenne so late to keep from getting killed, that's all. <laughs> I got my pilot's license to your manuals. Oh, yeah. That's one of the agents said, thank you, sir. Thank you. I did kind of a thrill every time I think of Wright Brothers flying 12 seconds over Kitty Hawk, and that changed the world. It never, never was the same again. I felt I was going to fly someday. Come to think of it, my dad kept telling me all about how many thousands of years people had yearned to fly. And I had a feeling then that we were going to do it, and I was going to be part of it.